Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today I wanted to talk a little bit about research, specifically for quant masters, and then I'm going to deviate and talk about why financial research is garbage in general. Uh, but let's just dive on in here to the master's degree. So many students reach out to me and say, Dimitri, um, I have a paper I need to write for my master's, I need to do some research. Um, what is like the hottest groundbreaking topic? Like, what can I do to really add value to get hired for a job? Uh, the truthful answer is there's nothing you can do as a master's student to create meaningful research. There's just not enough time. Like real meaningful, like, let me give you an example here on the job. Uh, on the job, well-experienced professional doing actual model development, which I'm going to put in air quotes as research because that's what finance thinks research is. Um, it's three months and that's full time, 40 hours a week. So now doing a master's degree paper, even if it's, you know, two semesters or something, but most of these programs are a year and a half, uh, you're not going to be able to put 40 hours per week for three months to get something done. It's just not going to happen. Now, even that, even building a model is not research and it's not groundbreaking and it's not going to change the way that we view the world. So I'm sorry. It's just, that's just how it is. Now, going for a PhD, on the other hand, again, going back down to research topics, you need to eat, sleep and breathe one topic. You need to love it. Like I love time series. Like I can go down rabbit holes with time series and get into the math and a bunch of other things, but it has to be pure theoretical time series, things that would actually add value to the entire world. Now, so on a master's program here, you're not going to be able to do research, but I'm going to explain why writing a thesis for a master's is good before I deviate into the research spectrum of finance here and economics. Um, research is great for a master's thesis because it shows that you know the process of model development, um, which essentially is the research process. So you need to define the problem, come up with a hypothesis, and then you need to take the data, go find the data, which is actually hard to do in the real world as well, uh, get the data, do some research on it. So figure out what type of methodologies you could use, figure out issues with your data, figure out variable selection, define the model structure, uh, look at estimations of the coefficients in the model. So again, in a model, the structure would be how many variables there are and if there's serial correlation, those sort of things. And then the estimation component piece here, the issue that you need to estimate is typically like beta coefficients. Uh, again, those are challenging because if you have serial correlation or you know your variables are non-stationary or whatnot, uh, you have estimation issues. So it's like a two-part process here, understanding that. And then being able to explain those issues and problems you ran into in an interview are excellent if you can actually understand what you did and why you did it, which most people that write master's papers, unfortunately, don't really understand what's going on. Uh, but again, it, it adds value in that sense that you've gone through the steps, you know the process, and then finally you have writing skills. So if I can read your paper, um, I don't really care how interesting it is per se. What I'm really looking for is that you can actually write and explain ideas and that you understand the process of doing research or AKA model development uh, in the finance and economic community. So doing a research paper is good in some ways. I don't necessarily think it's the best thing if you do a research paper or you do a class, but I do think it really helps in the writing and the explanation piece. And that is something that's really hard to kind of show in a master's program if you have not done a thesis. So it is good, just lower your expectations. You're not gonna do anything groundbreaking. You're not gonna shock a practitioner. Um, you're most likely not even going to do the process right, but at least you're starting to learn how to go through that struggle, which is what we want in researchers and model developers, is to be able to struggle with problems over a period of time uh, and then write a paper on that. So communicate those ideas. Now, finance as a whole here, why I don't read. So people ask, why don't you read all these research papers and why don't you do this? Because the problem with finance is it's just garbage. The whole industry, the whole economic community as well, 99% uh, of every single publication in finance and economics is just pure garbage. And I've been asked to peer review papers for journals in areas which I have been deemed an expert on in the credit risk realms. And again, I'm not qualified to be reviewing a lot of these papers because they're not even in my little niche area expertise. Uh, diving down the rabbit hole of working on like loss and pricing models. They're typically like market driven, you know, credit default issues with, you know, stock exchanges and everything else. I don't work on that side. So again, why would you ask me to do that? Again, these journals are just nonsensical. Um, the papers themselves are just garbage because they're anecdotal evidence at best. 
So I see a ton of papers and it's like, I went out and I found this free data online or I convinced this firm to give me some data and I went out and I built this model and this model says the world works like this. And you're looking at it like this violates every single common sense reality of what research academically and scientifically is. Because again, is your data, your sample, is it representative of the population? No, it's not. Uh, are you just searching to publish papers for the sake of publishing papers? Yes. Uh, the conclusions that are written and come off of these, it's like a one snapshot rinky dink sample on papers. And I feel really bad, but I have people that approach me who are PhDs and well-respected and well-known. And again, the papers are just garbage. Like I've seen papers that are in my area of expertise. So again, throwing out all those requests for me to actually review papers, looking at papers that are actually my area of expertise. And it's like, essentially, I found these two things are correlated and therefore I think this is a relationship and this is my conclusion. Uh, that's not how the world works, guys. I'm sorry, you are not Fisher Black. You did not write the Black-Scholes model. You did not come up with something groundbreaking. 99.9%, uh, .9%, as I've mentioned before, are not groundbreaking, useful papers. Now, that being said, I think the Journal of Finance and some of the other journals as well. So I'm not going to go too far into specific journals because again, I don't read all these financial journals. Uh, I know Journal of Finance is supposed to be one of the better ones. So, you know, we'll go, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole again on that, on rankings and which ones are better and worse and all that. Um, I do think there is value though in adding and writing papers uh, in the sense that they are white papers. They are not academic papers. They are purely white papers. Uh, a white paper is a practitioner's perspective or view. That's essentially what all this is. So, Let's say you want to write a paper on something simple like, I don't know, model development for expected credit loss. Something we fairly all well know and understand, and yet there's new methods and there's people trying different types of models and people come out and say, okay, I tried using, I don't know, GBM instead of logistic regression, and I built this model again on it should be at least 10 plus models and sets of data here. So 10 separate individual samples, uh, hopefully on, you know, subprime prime, like a bunch of different populations to get a better understanding of it. And then again, it's still just a anecdotal piece of, I took 10 samples. I did my best shot. Uh, this one outperforms this other one because of these five reasons. And again, it should go theoretical. It should drive down into the nuanced details of the theory of why this should apply continuously in the future and also where are the weaknesses and why won't it apply in different areas or situations in the future. Um, again, that would just be a better white paper. These are not academic resources. So anyways, those are my two cents on the master's research guys. Don't take too much. I don't know weight too much salt, I guess. Don't, don't spend your time thinking like you're going to write the world's most perfect master's paper. Um, because you don't have the time, you don't have the resources, uh, but again, take the time and effort to realize it's the process. I want to see you go through the process. I want you to struggle with the research problem. I want you to explain to me in your interviews when you're looking for jobs, come to me and say, Dimitri, I wrote this paper. I did this research. Um, and then I start asking, you know, what problems did you come about and say, oh, the data didn't do this and it wasn't perfect and it didn't work. And so we tried this, that, and the other, and these sorts of tests failed. And that's why we came to this conclusion. Like, Guys, the real world's not perfect. Um, again, finance and economics is not a hard science. It is art and science because it's really a soft science. It's studying people. People are irrational. They do not do things consistently. Uh, and that's why many people in the hard sciences just can't comprehend finance and they don't do well in an industry as well. So anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time.